Hello, hello, Marvelous Algebra 1 students, and welcome back to your Topic 5 unit on piecewise and linear absolute value functions. Uh, today we're going to run through Lesson 5.6, which is actually about solving absolute value equations. Um, but we spent the last couple of classes on graphing, so actually that's what we're going to do. We're going to solve these equations using graphs. Um, but we're going to start today with solving equations using algebra because that seems to make the most sense. That's how we've generally solved equations in the past. Uh, so we'll do a nice warm-up from topic four. And in fact, for those of you that have done your retakes, I think you find that this uh, goal solving systems of equations might be pretty fresh in your mind. Uh, so we're going to solve each of these using substitution. And I wanted to give you a quick reminder about how substitution works before you started solving. With substitution, you want to look for an equation, sometimes both, but at least one equation that's solved for a variable. So on the first problem, I see four variables here, but only one of those four is completely isolated. Do you see the one? And yeah, you might be tempted to say, oh, the y down here, but it actually has a 2x attached to it. Um, so instead, I'm going to take this y up here. This y is completely isolated. And so I'm going to just consider for now the top equation is solved. The bottom equation is not solved, though. So I'm going to rewrite the bottom equation. You might want to write a little bit small here. Um, you're going to probably need two columns, actually. And maybe I'll do it something like this and then go here. There we go. Um, and so I'm going to rewrite this bottom equation. And to rewrite the bottom equation, we're going to go 2x plus. And then when you solve for something, that means you're allowed to replace it. And this equation is solved for y, which means we're going to replace the y in this second equation that I'm rewriting. And we'll replace it in a second. But can you see that the second equation says 2x plus a big blank where y was equals 17? And now let's replace the y. And we're going to replace the y with what the first equation is solved for. y is equal to 2x minus 3. And now we're going to solve. We have a single equation left over. And there's only one variable in that equation. There's an x. There's a couple x's. But that tells us then that we're going to end up solving for x. As a hint, when you do solve for x, don't distribute the 2x. The 2x is not multiplying. The only thing that's multiplying is an invisible 1. In fact, we can just drop the parentheses right away, like so. I would suggest you probably combine like terms from here, right? 2x plus 2x is going to give you 4x's. And there's a minus 3 equals 17. And I'll let you finish solving it. After you find x, don't forget that you also need to solve for y. And then we're just going to write our answer as we typically have as an x comma a y. And that's what you're doing for each one. You're substituting, solving, and going from there. So see if you can solve each one, write your answers out. This will probably take you about five or six minutes or so. Um, but once it looks like your classmates are finishing, you can ask them for help. You can check your answers with them. Um, and then you can unpause me, and I'll go through the answers with you. Ready, set. All right, and you're back. So I will run through each of these. If you need, you can always skip forward a little bit. Um, but let's tackle this first one. So for the first one, 4x minus 3 equals 17. Our end goal is to get x alone. And x is certainly not alone up here. There's a 4 and a 3. And so we undo each of those. That's back to our sad map situation. right? And in sad map, we always want to undo our subtraction first. And then we're going to tackle, and I'll just box it here, then we're going to tackle the multiplication second. So to undo subtraction, we add 3 to each side. This was supposed to be in purple, but my pen decided to not change. There we go. All right, that gives me 4x equals 20. And now we can undo the multiplication, of course, with division. And that will give us that x equals 5. We have part of our answer down below. Now the nice part with substitution is once you have x or once you have one of the answers, finding y is much easier. Just go back and use the equation that's already isolated, y equals 2x minus 3. And we now know the value of x. So I'm going to replace x with its value. 
2 times x minus 3, where x is, of course, 5. And then you can either substitute all this into your calculator or just do some quick mental math. 2 times 5 is 10, and 10 minus 3 is 7. And so we have our point, 5 comma 7. Okay, let's try another one. All right, this one might have thrown you for a bit of a loop. It's a weird one. Um, but we're really going to try and do the same thing as before. Okay, so let's follow the same steps. y equals this, so y is solved, which means we work with the other equation, and we leave a blank for the y. Plus x equals 4. And what do we replace the y with? Well, negative x plus 1. That's what the first equation is equal to. There's nothing multiplying by the parentheses, so I'm going to drop the parentheses. I will put in the invisible ones, though, that are on the x's. I think that'll be helpful right now. Because what ends up happening here is we have negative 1x. When we go to combine like terms, negative 1x plus 1 or 1 minus 1, those cancel. And all we're left with is 1 equals 4. So does that mean x is 1, y is 4? No, there are no x's and no y's, and this isn't true. We put a slash to it. That's not equal. This is false. So what that means then is that there is no solution to this equation. We don't need to do anything else. There is nothing else to do. All right, let's tackle our last one. So for the last one, oh, this one's a weird one because both equations are already solved for y. But that's okay. Let's just keep doing the same thing. Let's work the top equation. That's solved, and so I'm going to move on to the bottom one. I'm going to leave a blank for the y, put parentheses if you want, okay, equals 6 minus 1x. What goes in for the y? Well, 18 minus 5x. There's nothing happening with these parentheses, so I'm just going to go ahead and let them drop. And then this is one of those situations where we have x's on both sides. And when we have x's on both sides, then we usually want to bring them all to one side. And it doesn't matter which side. I'm usually of the mind that I like to make my x's positive. And so to do that, I'm going to get rid of the bigger negative. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and add 5x to this side. That will cancel out the x's. And then I'll add 5x to its like term on the other side. I said add. Ha! So this is going to give me 18 over here. And on this side, we have a 6. And then negative 1 plus 5 is the same as 5 minus 1. That's 4. OK. From here on out, we want to focus on the side with x. We're trying to get x alone. There are two numbers attached to x. There's a 6 that's adding, and I'll go ahead and throw PEMDAS over here since it's sad map, since I didn't use this space. Always good to keep a record. The 6 is adding, so we'll undo that with subtraction. And the 4 is multiplying, so we'll undo that with division. So subtracting the 6 first, that leaves me with 12 equals 4x. And then we undo the multiplication. And 12 divided by 4, I think, is usually 3. So our answer is going to have a 3 in it. The last part is the easy part. Take either equation. It doesn't matter which one in this case, because they're both isolated for y. Um, I'm going to use the bottom equation, actually. That one seems easier. And so my bottom equation is y equals 6 minus x. And now we know the value for x. It's 3. So y equals 6 minus 3. And hopefully we're confident that 6 minus 3 is 3. It's the same answer for x as it is for y. Great. Here is your nice reminder, and that is the most algebra that we're going to do today, of how to solve a system using substitution. Now, hopefully you're curious about why we did this. And of course, one reason is it's good to review. It's going to be on the final, and we're going to use this a lot over the next couple of years in math. Um, but the other reason is because it directly relates to what we're doing today. So let's get to it. True or false? You can always distribute when you have absolute value. And hopefully you remember, we did this a couple of classes ago, this is false. You're actually not allowed to distribute. 
this is wrong. These are not equal. And this is really kind of where your friendship with distributive property ends. We really don't distribute as much moving on to the future um, for algebra and for math um, because distributive property is a shortcut. It's not part of PEMDAS. None of the letters in PEMDAS stand for distributive property. The D in there is division, not distribute. And so, although sometimes distributive property can be useful, you really need to learn when you can and when you can't use it, and absolute value is usually a pretty hard no-no. So, why is that relevant? Well, the idea of algebra is it's trying to allow us to solve for x. But if you have a problem like this, where they said, I want you to solve for x when it's 5 equals 2 times the absolute value of x minus 3, um, we have a problem because we don't know how to undo absolute value, right? If we think about SADMEP in here, we know how to undo addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. There is a way to undo exponents. We haven't talked about it yet. And the only way we've had to undo parentheses has been distributive property. But we don't even have that because, as mentioned, it doesn't work with absolute value. And so, if we can't undo the absolute value, we can't get to the stuff on the inside. Absolute value is like a force field protecting that x minus 3. So we're not going to be able to isolate x. Or will we? Because our last two lessons, today's and next lesson, are how we can solve an equation without maybe necessarily isolating x. So to do this, we're actually going to do the opposite of how we solved the opener. Instead of having two equations, and on the opener we had two equations, and we combined them into one, now we're going to take one equation and split them into their two parts. So what does that look like? Well, we're over here. We have one equation. We're going to split this into two separate equations. We've actually done this once before as well, but this is a nice reminder of what's happening. So here is one equation. I'm leaving a gap out front for a reason. And here is my other equation. I took the left side and the right side completely separately. But you might be uh, kind of squinting your eyes, striking your head right now, uh, because neither of these are equations. Equations require what? Oh yeah, they require an equal sign. And when we did this before, what went in front of the equal sign? Well, think about what we did back up here, right? We had this, and what went in front of the equal sign? Oh, that's right, a y. So we're going to go ahead and put in that y for each one. In fact, this is the third problem from the opener. Hopefully you can see that you can set these equal to each other through substitution. So go ahead and try these other two. Rewrite them so that they're y equals on both problems. And then unpause me. This should only take a minute. And then we can go ahead and see how you're doing. Ready, set, go. All right. Hopefully you had success here. This, is, this part is not too crazy challenging. You're just taking one side of the equal sign and you're putting it equal to y. And it doesn't even matter which side, right? I could put this one down below if we wanted. Okay, and then you're taking the other side of the equal sign, and it fills the other part. So 5 and absolute value, 2x minus 3. Great. Now, why did we do this? Well, there are three ways to solve a system of equations. Those are, hmm, what do you remember? One of them, we just did it up above, is called substitution. And we kind of did backwards substitution down here. The second one is the really cool method, elimination, and that's where you a lot of times will multiply an equation by a number and then add the equations together. We didn't do that today. And then there's one other way to solve, and it has to do with this idea of answers. Right? These answers here look like coordinate points, x's and y's, and that should always make you think of a graph, because the third way we have to solve is through graphing. Now, because algebra tends to usually be faster than graphing, right, we didn't have to make an x-y axis or do anything, but we tend to use substitution and elimination more. But because we don't know how to use algebra to solve absolute value, to undo it, we're going to use graphing today. So here's the general process. You're going to take your equation, 
and turn it into a system of two equations. That's like what we did up here. We had one equation and it became two. You're going to graph each equation. And then remind me, when you graph each equation, they make shapes, right? We have our xy axis. If we have one graph and then we have another graph, well, where is the solution? The solution is, of course, the intersection of those two graphs. So find the intersection of the two graphs. And then because the original equation didn't have a y, you could write the intersection as x comma y, but all they really care about are the x values. So you really just need the x, and I said values because they may cross more than one time, but you just need the x or the x values for your answer. Can you write it like this? Sure, not a big deal. All right, so let's turn the page. Let's do um, a couple quick examples, and then you guys will have the rest of class to finish this off. Okay. So example one, go ahead and solve this. Well, this looks pretty intimidating, and I don't want to use algebra today, so let's use our same trick. Let's take our first equation, like so, and our second equation. All right. Go ahead and pause me. See if you remember how to graph those two equations. We'll have two different graphs on here. Take maybe two or three minutes, and then unpause me, and we'll see how you did. Ready, set, go. All right. So when you graph these two, we should realize that one equation has absolute value and one does not. We've been living in absolute value land for a while, so let's tackle this purple one first. Um, this is an HK form, so we know that this is going to be negative 2 comma negative 3. That's right here. Perfect. Then we're going to use our slope. But where is that a value? Oh, we know if there's no slope written, it's a 1 over 1. So I'm going to go up 1 over 1 to the right, and I'm going to be pretty accurate with this. If we want to find the intersection point of these two, yeah, we want to make this pretty accurate, like so. But that just makes a line. Absolute value should make a v. So don't forget to go up 1 over 1 to the left as well. There we go. All right. There's our first graph. Now, what about the second one? Where's the absolute value here? Well, I don't think there is any absolute value here. This is actually a line. This is in the form of mx plus b. And we know the b is the beginning on the y-axis, so that's at negative 1. And then this is just our slope, up 1 over 3. So I'm going to go up 1 and over 1, 2, 3, up 1 over 1, 2, 3 or down 1 over 1, 2, 3, down 1 over 1, 2, 3. And it's just a line this time, not a V-shaped graph, and it looks like this. Well, what are my solutions? Well, where do the lines cross? I'll label those in a nice friendly green. Looks like one intersection is negative 3, comma, negative 2, and the other one is 0, comma, negative 1. When we write our solutions, we're just interested in the x's. The original equation only had x's. So I'm just going to take negative 3 over here and 0. Negative 3 and 0. And we write them in these curly braces to show that they're not a point. It's not the point negative 3, 0. This is a fancy way to say x equals negative 3 and x equals 0. I just didn't want to have to write that all out, so I smushed it all together with those cool curly braces. And that's it. All right, let's go ahead and try one more. So pause me, see if you can do all of example two without my assistance, and then we'll come back together once you've attempted. Ready, set, go. All right, we're back. We'll do the same thing. This time I'll do, I don't know, let's do green and purple. So two equation, y equals negative, and then there's that invisible 1 hiding there, so we might as well put it, x minus 1 plus 2, and the purple one, y equals plain old 4. All right, let's go ahead and graph. Green equation first, absolute value land, hk, 1, 2, like so, and our slope, down 1 over 1, so it's reflected, it's going in a downward direction this time. There we 
go and the other direction as well paying pretty close attention to those points just so we can see exactly where our two graphs cross and then how do we deal with four well we've seen this a few times some of you might remember but I usually like to show the X's that go with four and there are no X's are there there are zero X's that are attached to this positive four and we can graph that because now, just like up above, this is an mx plus b form. My beginning of my graph is at 4, and my slope is up 0. We can always write it as a fraction over 1. So 0 over 1, 0 over 1, right? This is just going to make us a horizontal line. There we go. All right, and then we answer our question. What is the solution or solutions? Um, I don't think these graphs cross anywhere, do they? So what is the solution? Well, if you think back to the opener, we saw something like that. It is certainly possible that graphs have no solution, and that is when they do not intersect. So in this case, we would just say no solution. Oops, and try to do curly braces better. There we go. And that's that. All right, so here is a fun little challenge for you. In the two examples above, we saw an equation that had two solutions. That was the first example, and one with no solution. I would like you, please, to graph a system of equations. So it's going to have one absolute value graph, could have more than one, that only has one solution. So you're going to make two different graphs on here where they intersect in only one spot. And then once you've done that, go ahead and write your system of equations and the single combined equation. And don't forget to list your solutions. Now the tough part about this with me doing a video is there are many different ways to do this. And I've seen some really cool examples. Um, so I will show a bunch of examples after, but I really want you guys to strive to graph two equations that only cross one time. Ready, set, All right, so the ways that I've seen people do this before, and there are many different ways, is I'm just going to pick a random vertex. I'll pick this as my vertex. And people have said, well, we know we have to do at least one absolute value. Here's one. And then they said, could I just do another absolute value that has the same vertex but goes the other direction? Sure, those only cross in one spot. And so over here, you would do y equals, and you'd write the first equation. y equals, you'd write the second equation, and you'd make it match up. You'd use your vertex, your slopes, all that stuff. And then the solution would be where they cross, 1, 2, um, so just the x of 1. And the single equation would just be all of this on one side, and all of the purple on the other side. Now, there are other ways to do this as well. And so one way, as my screen just zooms out for fun, um, one way that I really enjoyed seeing people do, I'm going to get rid of this purple graph right here, um, is they've gone and they've said, well, what if I just did a line like this? This line is parallel to this blue side, so it's only going to cross in this one spot. And they get through it by making a line in an absolute value function. So you'd have a line down here, maybe an HK form, maybe use parentheses to get that line. Um, and then you've got your absolute value function. I've also seen people do a horizontal line that only crosses one time as well. So in this case, that would be the equation y equals 2. And that's great as well. So I don't know how you want to write yours, but be creative. Come up with those equations. And then you guys can move on to your main task for today, which is some practice. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six problems just like this, where we have two equations, one right here and one right here. You're going to graph each equation and see where they intersect. And once you find the intersections, you'll write your answers up here. Okay, So you're going to try those. Um, if you finish early, you can check your answers with the people around you. And then if you get stuck, of course, you can always skip to the part you got stuck on, or you can watch all of the answers. 
And then last but not least, we have a nice little word problem, application problem to finish off class for today. So go ahead, try definitely this third page first, and then check your work, and then move on to the last page. Ready, set, go. All right, let's get this first one done and see if that gives you a um, nice hint on the rest. So each of these should be in the form of y equals and y equals. I'll probably leave that off most of the time because it's implied. Um, the one that I have in orange here is in absolute value. It's our hk form, 1 comma 2. And then we have our slope, up 1 over 2. So up 1 over 2, up 1 over 2, and same thing to the left. As we go through and graph, we see this nice V-shaped graph. And then last but not least, we have y equals 4, which we actually did on the other page. We know that that's that nice horizontal line. I see two intersection points. One intersection point is 5, 4, and the other is negative 3, 4. We only care about the x values for our solutions, so that looks like negative 3 and 5. Ta-da! Let's try our next one. Okay. Our next one over here um, gives a little bit of a trickier absolute value graph to create. Um, I'll again just try to keep the theme of orange and green going, pretty easy to see. Uh, but I'm going to rewrite this orange one up above. I'll keep the negative 3 quarters, keep the x, um, but then we need something inside the x. Our hk form, we know that our um, vertex is going to end with a 3, but what's on the inside? And so we've covered it a few times, but if nothing is written there, we can always place a 0 inside. So this hk form should start at 0, 3. And then my slope is up 3 over 4, but the negative reflects that. So it's going to go down 1, 2, 3, and then over 1, 2, 3, 4. And same thing in the other direction. Then we can connect. We got the first one and the second one. Nice. Last but not least, we have y equals 5, which is again a horizontal line. Oh, and we should be able to see here that our solution, if they never cross, is no solution. And I ran out of room, so I made it work. Third one. And at any point, if you guys are feeling more confident, you should pause the video and try it on your own. It's A, boring to listen to me explain it all, and B, it doesn't do any thinking for you, and your brain just shuts down. So let's try these guys right here. Our first one, typical absolute value, 2 comma 3. Good. And we, of course, have our slope of 1 over 1 out front. And I'll try to be accurate. Here is 1 up one over one the other direction, here is the other, nice. And then our next one is also two comma three, overlap, but now it's down one over one. And so as we go down one over one, we look like this. There we go. And we have two different graphs that look like they only meet at one place. Looks like they meet at two comma three. The x is all we care about, and we're set. All right, fourth one looks pretty similar to the third one, doesn't it? Looks like we start at 2 comma 3. That's exactly the same graph as the third one. Up 1 over 1. Good. Up 1 over 1. Also good. And then we do the one in purple. Ah, but this one's a different point. This is 2 comma 4. There we go. And then it's still the down 1 over 1. Oh, this one is different. Interesting. So as we go through and connect this, there we go, we can see that there are two intersection points, but where do they cross? Those don't look like nice numbers. Uh-oh. I bet you can still figure it out, though. This looks perfectly in the middle. So to go perfectly in the middle of 2 and 3, that looks to me like 2.5. And then to go perfectly in the middle of 3 and 4 is 3.5. So I think one answer is 2.5 comma 3.5. And on the other side, we have the same thing. But looking at this one, I think between 1 and 2 is 1.5 comma 
So I see two answers here, 1.5 and 2.5, or one and a half and two and a half. All right, two to go. Let's take a look here. Absolute value, and it's just x plus one. So I think maybe I'll use some space over here and rewrite that. Absolute value, x plus one. We know the invisible slope's out front, but what about the k value? We know we're gonna start at negative one because of the inside, but the k value, oh, we know that's a zero, right? Negative one comma zero. And then our slope of up one over one in each direction and the other way as well. There we go. What about the other equation though? There it is, hiding over here. Um, let's go ahead and do this guy, which is, well that looks like HK form as well, negative one comma three. Oh, but wait, this has parentheses. And so we know that this isn't gonna make a V. Parentheses are a giveaway that this makes a line. We still use the slope, up two over one, up two over one, but we don't go the other direction. We continue the pattern of up two over one to move down in this direction, right? And we end up with this guy. Now this one isn't even parallel over here, but I don't think that they'll cross again, so it looks like there's only one solution, negative two comma one, and so the only x we care about is negative two. Last but not least, we have problem six. Oh, these equations look weird. Our first one is negative x. Well, there's no absolute value, so I know it makes a line. We know we can always put an invisible one for a slope. And what's my y-intercept here? As always, if nothing is adding, we can always put a zero. And this gives us our mx plus b form. b is the y-intercept. Then my slope tells me to go down one over one. We know we have to make it work for us um, in that this needs to be a negatively sloped line. Negatively sloped lines go in a downward direction from left to right. And then we have our other one, absolute value of x. That's that V-shaped graph with a minus two at the end. So I know I start at a negative two. What happens on the inside? Oh, well, there's that invisible zero again. So zero, negative two is down here. And then, of course, we use our invisible slope of up one over one in each direction. So here is one side. It looks like those lines are parallel, so they'll never intersect. But on the other side, we do have one intersection point, and it looks like it's at one comma negative one, or an x value of one. All right, hopefully this was looking okay for you. Good practice graphing all the way through, and it's a really nice and clever way to solve an equation. So you guys have one part left. That's this part two review through application. A lot of them are just questions for you to answer, but there is a little bit of math there. And why don't you try it? Once you've tried it, we'll come back and go through it together. Ready, set. All right, let's read through this. Julian wants to save $10 per day. That's like a rate. That's how fast we're saving. And we're going to save that for eight days. Then Julian's going to spend $10 per day for another eight days. Hmm. It's like I'd probably just spend the $80 all at once, but all right, I guess he's disciplined. The graph below models the amount of money that Julian has each day. So let's look at the x and the y axis. It looks to me like our x-axis has a label of time in days. And if we look at those x-intercepts, um, it looks like there's an x-intercept over here at 16, comma, 0, and 0, comma, 0. And I think that makes sense, right? If he saves for 8 days and then spends for another 8, 8 plus 8 is 16, and then he gets down to 0. In fact, that suggests to us that the zeros here are the amount of money, the y-value. And so if we count up, let's see, 50 and 100, is this 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70? It looks like this is 80 right here, which should make sense. If you save $10 for eight days, then this point, five, six, seven, eight, the vertex of our graph is eight days, and now we have $80. All 
All right, so let's start with A. On which days will Julian have $60? Well, I'd suggest going to the y-axis, here's 50, here's 60, and then we can just do a little dashed line across and see where they intersect. Do you see how this is kind of relevant to today? We have two points on here. We have the point 6, 60, and we have the point, this looks like, 10, 60. So if we have 6, 60 and 10, 60, then which days will Julian have $60 on? Well, the days will just be the x values here, or the time, right? And so it will be day 6 and day 10. What's an equation that could represent this graph? Well, I see a v-shaped graph, so it's got to be absolute value, right? Absolute value, x, and we have some spaces. Let's do the vertex first, since we already have that. 8, 80, so minus 8 plus 80. And then let's go through and find the slope. Now the slope is tricky, tricky, tricky. So I'm going to clean this graph up a bit just so we can see, and then I'll zoom in over here. So if we look at this vertex and we go down and over, you might be tempted to say that the slope is down 1 over 1, but I don't think you'd be quite correct here. If we look at the over 1, this goes 8, 9, 10. That makes sense. It does go over 1. So I agree with the bottom. But the top is the tricky part because we're saying that it goes, and I'll zoom in even further, we're saying that it goes down 1. But if you look over here, from 80 down 1 would be 79. But I don't think that is 79. Isn't this 70? So we're not going down 1. How far is it from 80 to 70? And hopefully you're thinking 10, 10, 10. Yeah, you go down 10 and over 1 to make this graph. So our equation here, knew it would zoom out, silly me, um, is down 10 over 1. So once I find where we were, there we are, it's going to be down 10 over 1 for our slope. And if you wanted to clean that up a bit, you could just say negative 10 times x minus 8 plus 80, and that would be fine as well. Okay, what's next? Solve the equation below graphically. Negative 10 x minus 8 plus 80. Oh, well, that's actually the graph that we already have up there. That's so nice of them. So this first equation right here, solving graphically, is like what we've spent today doing, right? We want to graph this negative 10 x minus 8 plus 80, we've already done that. That's up here. I'll retrace it in red. That is this equation. Whew. Tells us we got the equation right, too. Nice. Um, and then they want us to go through and graph the other side as well. And I believe the other side was 20. I also believe that my screen is frozen, which is very, very fun. Um, so maybe we'll have to do a quick restart on this. There we go. Um, so our other side should be 20. Catch up, computer. You can do it. I have faith in you. Maybe. Oh, we are really struggling here. We may have to pause and restart this program, but that's fine. Um, so we should be able to see that we're doing y equals 20. So if I go back up to the graph, the line y equals 20 is a horizontal line. Let's see, 10, 20. There it is. And so it's just going to go straight through my graph. I was not very neat, but that's okay. Um, it looks like we're at the point 2, comma 20. And 15, 14, comma 20. There we go. Yeah, 2 and 14 look like our answer. So x is going to be 2, and x could be 14 when the y is 20. Now, what did we just find? Well, that 20 and, if we put them as points, 2, comma 20 and 14, comma 20 are going to tell us something about Julian's net worth for these 16 days. 2, 20, and 14, 20 are what we just found. What are they telling us? Well, we know the x is here. The x-axis is the time and days. So maybe we'll start with that. Um, we'll say at day 2 and day 14. Well, how do we build in the 20? 20 is the y value. That's the amount of money that Julian has. So at day 2 and day 14, 
Julian has $20, which should make sense. He should have 20 twice. He's saving up to 80 and then down back to zero. And so he gets 20, keeps saving, and then at the 14th day, he spends 10 more. All right. Marcus also begins saving on the same day as Julian. The computer is very struggling today. Apologies for that. Um, on the same day as Julian. However, he saves $20 per day for three days, which means he saves up to $60 total. Then he spends for three days. Graph Marcus's equation on the coordinate plane at the top of this page. Well, I think if he saves up to $60 total, and that happens three days in, I think they're telling us that the vertex is 3 comma 60. So if I jump back up to my graph, and I'm going to clean things up just so it makes more sense, um, we're going to go ahead and put the point 3 comma 60 on here. 5, 6, wait, 1, 2, 3, comma, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Here's 3 comma 60. And it says that Marcus saves for $20 per day, which to me tells me he's going to spend $20 per day. So he's going to go down 20 per day, down 20 per day, down 20 per day. And it makes sense if he starts at 3, he should end at 6. So down 20 per day, 20 per day, 20 per day. Here is Marcus's equation. There we go. That looks pretty good. All right, we've done that. Check. What is the equation that Marcus's, that models Marcus's savings? Easy for me to say. Um, well, again, we know it's an absolute value graph. We know the vertex is 3, 60. I think the only thing we need is the slope, which is also given to us, isn't it? We just counted it. It's down 20 over 1. So our slope will be negative 20 over 1. Gee, on what day, or maybe it should say days, do Marcus and Julian have the same amount of money? Well, if we look back here, um, the same amount of money, I think that means where our two graphs intersect. And I actually see two intersection points. Right at the beginning, they both start on day zero with zero dollars. And it also looks to me like we have one, two, three, four, four comma forty. So I see two answers here. So I'm going to say day zero, they have zero dollars. And day four, they have forty dollars. Nice. Last but not least, what's the range of Julian's equation and what's the range of Marcus's? So let's look at this visually here. Um, this graph does actually stop down here at the x-axis. And the reason I know it stops at the x-axis is it wouldn't make too much sense to keep going um, because our y-axis, this negative part down below, is how much money the boys have. And negative money is a weird situation. Does that mean they owe, they're in debt? I don't know. So we're going to assume that we start rate and end rate at the x-axis. And let's go ahead and focus on um, uh, Julian's equation first, which is this tall one up here. We know the range measures the height of the function. It looks like the top of Julian's function is 80, and the bottom is 0. right? So the range of money that he has goes from 0 to 80. And the way we can write that, um, did they call us the y value? No, so I'm just going to use y. So I'm going to say Julian can go from 0 all the way up to 80. What about Marcus? Well, Marcus's equation is the one I have in green. It looks like the top of his is 60, but the bottom is again 0. So same idea here. We have Marcus, and he is going from 0 to 60. We can compare those two. Right? Julian's range is a little bit larger because he saves for a little bit longer, even though he's saving less money per day. Marks is a little bit shorter. He you know, saves for a shorter amount of time. All right. Thank you, as always, for tuning into this. And hopefully today's lesson was pretty straightforward. Just a brief reminder of what we covered, though. Um, our plan for today was to solve absolute value equations.
but we ran into the issue of not being able to undo absolute value. So we kind of ran around the problem and approached it from a different point of view. And we said, well, we know how to substitute to solve systems. We know how to unsubstitute to make two equations, and we're pretty good at graphing. So what if we took an equation, broke it into two equations, graphed those and looked for the answers, which were the intersections. That is a way to solve an equation without having to do any algebra. However, if you missed your algebra, don't worry. Next class, our last lesson in this unit, we'll get back to the algebra and we'll talk about how we can solve absolute value equations using SADMEP, using algebra. Have a wonderful rest of your day and I'm excited to conclude this unit with lesson 5.7.